Kalispera says, good evening, everyone. Let me start by respectfully acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we gather, the Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Kulin Nation, and I pay our respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Uh, welcome to tonight's online seminar, which will be delivered by Dr. Angeliki Albanudi on the Greeks of Cairns in Northern Queensland. Allow me to go through some housekeeping items before we venture into tonight's uh, topic. Uh, we would like to thank the sponsor of tonight's seminar, Jeffrey Conahan, and I invite you all to become sponsors of a seminar of your choice. It's only a tax deductible $100 donation. Furthermore, let me remind you of next week's seminar on the revival of Greek wisdom in the Renaissance by Bernie Lewin. Um, this will be a hybrid seminar, so come and join us on the mezzanine level of the, of the Greek Center. For those that can't make it um, to the CBD, it will also be simultaneously be broadcast online on Facebook and YouTube. And just a reminder for those uh, that will have any questions during our Q&A interval at the end, simply submit those questions to the chat or comment section on Facebook or YouTube, and we will pick them up. Um, I pass the baton on to Konsperopoulos, who will be introducing the speaker tonight. Thank you, Nick. And um, hello, everyone here from, I'll be um, talking from Sydney, Australia, north of Murray River. It is an honour and privilege to be introducing today's speaker at the Greek Seminar Program. Tonight, our guest speaker, Dr. Angeliki Alvanuri, is a social linguist specialising in language and gender, language contact and language in interaction. She is currently lecturing at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, Greece, and is a research associate at the Institute of Modern Greek Studies. In April 2013, she graduated with a PhD from the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. In May 2013, she took up a two-year postdoctoral fellowship at the Language and Cultural Research Centre, James Cook University, in tropical Cairns, Queensland, to examine the Greek language spoken by Greek immigrant communities in far north Queensland, Australia. She has written the books Grammatical Gender and Interaction, Culture and Cognitive Aspects, published by Brew in 2015, and Modern Greek Diaspora, an Australian Perspective, published with Palgrave Pivot in 2019. She has published articles in various journals, including Gender and Language, Pragmatics, Text and Talk, the Journal of Greek Linguistics, and the Journal of Pidgin and Creole Languages. Tonight's seminar titled The Greeks of Cairns will examine the structure and use of the Greek language spoken by Greek immigrants in Cairns, far north Queensland, Australia. In the first part of the talk, Dr. Angeliki anal analyzes language conduct induced changes such as lexical borrowings from English into Greek, which are motivated by intense contact with the English speaking host community and cultural pressure associated with the prestige of the dominant language. In the second part of the talk, Dr. Angeliki will show that my Greek immigrants switch languages to pursue the recipient's response, accomplish actions that invoke a symmetric between speak and hearer report direct speech, make positive assessments, or display various aspects of the identities. Her fieldwork and research analyzed data derived from participant observations in some 23 hours of audio and video recorded conversations with first and second generation Greek immigrants. The issues of language and identity continue to play a pivotal role in the study of Greek communities throughout Australia. According to the 2021 Australian Census, Greek remains one of the top languages with 229,643 Greek speak, speakers people, although this is, is, is a decline of 8,000 people from the 2016 census. Nevertheless, the Greek language is still in the top 20, 12 spoken languages in Australia, coming at sixth place. Thank you for listening. I'll pass the virtual floor to Dr. Angeliki Alvanudi. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, good morning from Thessaloniki. Kalimera, από τη Thessaloniki. Uh, it's a great pleasure to join the Greek History and Culture Seminars organized and hosted by the Greek community of Melbourne. Uh, today, I would like to explore with you uh, the linguistic practices of Greeks living in Cairns, far north Queensland, uh, drawing on the research I conducted back in 2013-2015 during my postdoctoral fellowship at James Cook University. More specifically, I will examine the structure and the use of the Greek language spoken by immigrants in Cairns, and I will analyze language contact and use changes, uh, more specifically the borrowing of lexical items and code switching. Uh, for this purpose, I will bring together contact linguistics, social linguistics, and interactional linguistics. 
I have tried to tone down the academic register as much as I could, but still this is a talk by a linguist, so if you have questions about the terminology deployed, we can engage with your questions at the end. Um, uh, let me just mention that the findings um, of my research are uh, presented and discussed in detail in uh, two publications, my book, uh, Modern Greek in Diaspora and Australian Perspective, published in 2019, and the journal article uh, that was published in the Journal of Greek Linguistics in 2018, and it is open access. So in case you are interested, you can access uh, this work online. Uh, language contact is a well-researched topic in linguistics. Here I give you some uh, important uh, contributions to the field. Uh, yet to date, there are very few in-depth studies of Greek varieties spoken away from Greece. For example, Siemens' seminal study, uh, published in 1972 on Greek spoken in the United States. Tammy's work, published in 1986 on Greek spoken in Victoria, Australia and the research conducted by Angeliki Rally and her colleagues here in Greece uh, on the Greek spoken uh, in Canada. Uh, so today we will look at original data from a speech community that had received no attention in the linguistic literature until 2013, and we will gain a better understanding of variation in Greek and diaspora more generally. This is uh, the outline of my talk. Uh, I will start with some theoretical preliminaries, uh, some historical information and demographic information about the Greek population in Cairns. Uh, I will say a few things about the research methodology uh, deployed in this study. I will uh, discuss borrowing phenomena, code switching in Australian Greek, and you can see the different types of code switching here, code mixing, conversational code switching, participant-related code switching. We will give some examples. And uh, towards the end, I will discuss factors influencing the maintenance of Greek uh, in Cairns. Okay, so let's start with the Greek-speaking community in Cairns. Uh, as you know very well, and as was mentioned in the introduction, Australia is a country of linguistic and cultural diversity. Uh, Klein describes this diversity insightfully as an open-ended tension between English monolingualism as a symbol of a British tradition, English monolingualism as a marker of Australia's independent national identity, and multilingualism as a reflection of a social and demographic reality and of an ideology of an independent, multicultural and outreaching Australian nation. As you know, Greek is one of the many languages spoken in Australia by immigrant populations, and the Greek diaspora is one of the largest in the region. Let's have a closer look at the Greeks living in Cairns, a tropical, remote city of far north Queensland. A very beautiful place to be. Uh, as you can see here in the pictures, I'm pretty sure that many of you have visited this place. It was exciting for me to be there for at least two years. So. Uh, what about the history of Greeks living there? The first recorded Greek arrival in Queensland was about 1860, as Tamis reports. By the end of 1928, about 1,200 Greek immigrants lived in Queensland, working in cafe and hotel businesses. Some settled in Innisfail, Ayr, Goomery, working in cotton, sugarcane industry and tobacco plantations. The Greek community in Cairns consists of the children of these very first Greeks and also the Greeks who arrived in Australia after the Second World War and the Greek Civil War in the 60s, in the 70s and in the early 80s. Most of them come from the Greek islands of Rhodos, Kithira, Ithaki, Kassos and Kastelorizo. Some of them come from Macedonia, northern Greece, and a very few from Cairo, Egypt. Uh, basically, I met two people from Cairo. The Greek community in Cairns was very, very small back in 2013 uh, when I visited the place. The exact number of Greeks in Cairns was not known to me. Uh, during fieldwork, I met about 50 people. So it's a very small community, as you can see. Three groups of speakers have been identified. 
first generation Greeks who were born and raised in Greece and arrived in Australia after their adolescence, second generation Greeks who were born in Australia to first generation Greeks or born in Greece and arrived in Australia in their preschool years or early primary school years, and third generation Greeks who were born in Australia to second generation Greeks. Data were collected from 30 first generation Greeks, 50 to 90 years old, and 15 second generation Greeks, 40 to 80 years old. Today I will focus on the linguistic behavior of first generation Greeks. The contact situation in Kiens is language maintenance for first and partly second generation Greeks and language shift for third generation Greeks. Uh, basically, what we see in Kiens is that the first immigrant generation who arrived in Australia as adults are monolingual in their original language and have become late bilinguals. The second generation came as children or born there are bilingual, though perhaps with reduced speaking skills in Greek. And the third generation does not speak their parents' language much and have limited comprehension. First generation Greeks form a linguistic minority that became bilingual late after childhood in the dominant host group, uh, the English speaking community, and preserved their native language with minor language contact induced uh, changes. In general, Greek was spoken at home, in social activities, and at church. Let me say a few things about uh, the research methodology deployed. Uh, in this study in 2013, I conducted uh, linguistic fieldwork in Kent. I became a member of the community where the language was spoken. I immersed myself in daily social life and in daily language use. Uh, fieldwork was the best way to obtain first-hand observation of the language spoken in its natural setting. When I arrived in Kent, I didn't know anyone in the area except for my colleagues at the university. Uh, it was a quite adventurous time for me. Uh, I had to find a way into the group, so I tried to meet someone who would introduce me to other Greeks. Uh, a couple of months after my arrival in Kent, a colleague introduced me to a second generation Greek uh, female uh, who lived in Kent together with her mother, uh, a first generation Greek. And those two ladies became my, my very first informants and very, very good friends afterwards. The second step was to look for places where I could find Greeks. So I spotted the Greek Orthodox St. John Parish of Cairns and started participating in the religious and cultural activities at the parish. I spent time with my informants in private activities and public uh, social activities. Every Wednesday morning, senior Greeks would meet and play bingo in the parish hall. You can see one picture here. I would sit with, uh, together with them, join the bingo game, uh, during fieldwork, I employed basic ethnographic methods. I established relationships of friendship and intellectual partnership with my informants and spent time with them observing how they use Greek and English and how the use of the two languages interact with other social uh, practices and cultural practices more generally. I recorded conversations with 11 first generation Greeks and nine second generation Greeks after I got their consent. Uh, conversations and interviews took place in arranged meetings, in cultural activities at the St. John Parish of Kent, or during dinners and lunches at the informants' houses where I was a guest. I invited my informants to share their life stories or talk about the history of the Greek community in Kent or any other topic. Uh, and of course, data were anonymized, so the names of uh, uh, speakers that you will see shortly are not the real ones. Okay, a note on terminology. I think um, some theoretical preliminaries about language contact and language change will be useful. Uh, they will guide you through the data I will present shortly. So when we say language contact induced change, what we mean is any linguistic change that would, uh, that would have been less likely to occur outside the particular contact situation is due at least in part to language contact. This is what we have in mind when we think of language contact induced change in linguistics. Uh, borrowing is the transfer of features of any kind from one language to another as the result of contact. The language from which features are borrowed is the donor language or the source language, and the language into which these features are borrowed is the recipient or borrowing language. Lexical borrowing involves the transfer of lexical items, lexical material from the source language into the recipient language. 
And code uh, switching is the basic mechanism through which forms travel from one language into the other. And when we uh, use this term, we refer code switching, we refer to the alternate use of two or more languages within the same conversation, sometimes within the same utterance delivered by the same speaker or between different utterances delivered by different speakers. As we will see today, code switching has rich social and interactional functions. Okay, let's start with borrowing and let's have uh, a look at the data. <clears throat> uh, contact induced change in Greek spoken in Cairns mainly involves borrowing of lexical items. These lexical borrowings are divided into loan words and loan shifts. Loan words are words in which all or part of their morphemic composition derives from the source language. Uh, loan words combine native and imported morphemes, Greek and English morphemes. Uh, and they are adapted in terms of the phonology and morphology of standard modern Greek. <clears throat> Here you can see one example, to flori, the floor, to patoma in standard modern Greek. The loan word combines the English stem floor and the Greek affix e, which is inflected for neuter gender, nominative case and singular number. And uh, overall in the data, I found 31 loan words. All items except one are nouns, and this is of course not a surprise because previous studies have shown that nouns are among the most frequently borrowed elements in language contact situations. Let's have a look at some of the loan words. Um, I found, okay, loan words assigned, sometimes they are assigned, some loan words are assigned to the same gender as the equivalent term in standard modern Greek. To flati, flat, to the amerisma in standard modern Greek. To flataki, the little flat. To the amerismataki, to caro, car, to autokinito, to carpeto, carpet, to hali, to contrato, contract, to simbolio, to tiqueto, ticket, to isitirio, to hotel, hotel, to xenodochio, to basi, bas, to leoforio, to spitalia, hospital, to nosocomio, to grilla, grill, psestaria, ishara, in standard modern Greek, blanketa, blanket, e cuverta, e marketa, market, e agora. And some loan blends or loan words are assigned to a different gender than the equivalent term in standard modern Greek. E frisa, fridge, to psigio, e basketa, basket, to calafi, e ambula, ambulance, astan to astanoforo. To stake, steak, e brizola, to recite, receipt, e apodixi, to yari, yard, e avli, tabilla, bills, e logargasmi, uh, to checki, check, e epitagi, to taxasi, tax, o foros, e manges, mangos, tamango. Sometimes it's indeterminate whether the loan word is assigned to the same gender or to a different gender than the equivalent term in standard modern Greek. To traki, track, to fortigo or idalika in standard modern Greek. Iwenza, wage, omistos, iamevi in standard modern Greek. To boxi, box, to kuti, kuta in standard modern Greek. Uh, we also find double gender assignment in these words to buki or to buko, book, to viblio. To rufi or orufis, roof, to tavani, yorofi in standard modern Greek. Um, here the point is that the endings of loan words that match the Greek endings are reanalyzed as pieces of Greek inflection, Greek grammar, and through them loan words are allocated to specific genders. So loan words ending in a are feminine, loan words ending in o and in e are neuter. Also, loan words. Um, denoting male uh, humans are grammatically masculine and loan words denoting female humans are grammatically feminine. Obosis, the male boss. Ibosena, the female boss. Opuftas, the pufter. Okay, there is also one adjective borrowed from English that combines the English stem flash, the Greek derivational suffix ik and the suffix o, which is marked for gender case and number. He had a flashic autokinito, he had a flashic car. Similar loan words are reported by Seaman and Tamis for the Greek spoken in the US and in Australia, respectively. 
These loan words are used interchangeably with the equivalent standard modern Greek terms. Sometimes speakers are not aware of the status of these words as borrowed items. Sometimes they are. For example, uh, certain speakers reported that using these terms in conversations in Greece caused confusion and misunderstanding with other Greek speakers. And maybe some of um, the members of the audience today have similar things to report. Let's see. Okay, let's move on to loan shifts. Pure loan translations or calcs, single words or fixed phrasal expressions, phrases, which combine native morphemes and imitation of the foreign pattern. That is, Greek morphemes and imitation of the English pattern. Grafo kato ta onomata, I write the names down. Aftos espase, he went broke. Piase to plio, catch the boat. From any epochi, wet season. Prina echune pedia, before they had kids. Fases prochno, I will push you. I will urge you. Me rotusan na kano ena dis. They asked me to make a dis. Kano me kalame te mitera tu. We are doing okay with his mom. These lexical units are not found in standard modern Greek. They copy syntactic patterns and semantic patterns found in English. It's basically an item by item translation of the English uh, unit. Uh, and these calcs, these loan shifts are probably due to frequency because they occur very frequently in spoken discourse. They do not seem to be associated with perceived gaps in the Greek language and similar calcs are reported by Seaman for the Greek spoken in the US and Tamis for the Greek spoken in Australia. Let's have a look now at, uh, yeah, okay, I missed that slide, but you can have a look. Yeah. Let's have a look at code switching patterns in Australian uh, Greek. Uh, and let's start with code uh, mixing. Code mixing refers to momentary intraclosal switches uh, or insertions that do not change the language of the interaction and do not carry any locally defined meanings. Mixing Greek with English produces utterances with hybrid structures in which most of the lexicon and morphosyntax comes from Greek, that's the matrix language, and single words or phrases are inserted from English, uh, that's the embedded language. English words that appear in code mixed utterances are congruent with their Greek counterparts. They are similar in semantics, syntactic and morphological properties and discourse function. Insertions consist of adjectives, nouns, noun phrases, verb phrases, adverbs, complement or main clauses and pragmatic particles or discourse markers. Let's start with adjectives. English adjectives are usually inserted in copula constructions. Epinekeitane violent. He was drinking and he was violent. Here you can see that in this utterance, epinekeitane violent, most of the lexicon and most of the morphosyntax comes from Greek. And a single word is inserted from English, which is congruent with its Greek counterpart, vios. Afto in a global, this is global. In a pio easy yaftos, it's easier for them. In a busy yitonia, the neighborhood is busy. Ola plastic in it, they are all plastic. English adjectives are also inserted as modifiers and noun phrases. Tom pink solomo, the pink salmon. Then I can a hard do yes, I didn't do hard jobs. Nouns or noun phrases can also be inserted in Greek um, utterances. Ihane hitters puzestenane. They had heaters that heated. Then it became a competition. There was no competition. In a sound house, it's like a house. In a long story, in a supo, it's, long, it's a long story to tell you. Can I make right job? We did the right job. The megalon is a fresh water. They grow them in fresh water. He had a good life. He had a good life. In general, neuter gender is assigned to the English nouns inserted. Otan dulevis get a community when you work for the community. I had the passport, I had the passport, to Brazil, uh, in Brazil, we were a good committee, we were a good committee, to past in the past, to perases, the past is the past, you've been through it, piece of the counter, behind the counters, the drug to bloody fish, you cannot eat the bloody fish, to spare time, do levy, in her spare time, she works. When I checked the telephone, I had three missed calls. When I checked my phone, I had three missed calls. Uh, English nouns denoting countries, states, cities, or days may also be assigned to feminine gender. T New Zealand, T Melbourne, Aftiti Thursday. Uh, the assignment of feminine gender to nouns denoting days may be due to the fact that in Greek, six out of the seven days of the week are grammatically feminine, the Tarte, 
and so on and so forth. Uh, the assignment of feminine gender to nouns denoting countries may be motivated by the tendency for Greek nouns denoting countries to be grammatically feminine. So there could be a pattern here. Verbs. Okay, what about verbs? The English verb phrases embedded in Greek consist of the verb form, always preceded by the personal pronoun that indicates person. I don't know Tikani. I don't know what he's doing. I hope na perasse. I hope it goes away. I was relieved pufigana. I was relieved that they left. It's megalo vivlio. It's a big book. Ala, it doesn't matter a popoine, ala, uh, but it doesn't matter where they come from. Also, bilingual compound verbs uh, occur very commonly in Australian Greek. These bilingual compound verbs are extremely common across various language contact situations. They consist of the Greek verb kano or ginome and English words that carry the semantic information of the predicate. The Greek verb kano or ginome uh, bears all the grammatical functions of the predicate. Uh, let's have a look at the first example. Uh, sometimes bilingual compound verbs combine the Greek verb kano and English verbs or verb phrases. Kano enjoy, I enjoy, kano use, I use, kano advise, kano retire, kano travel, kano think, kano attract, kano read, kano move, kano look after, kano design clothes, kano invent something. Or we may find, uh, sometimes we find the Greek verb kano plus English nouns and noun phrases, kano exams, uh, kano feeling, kano good time, kano vacuum cleaner, kano high school. Uh, or uh, we may find Greek, the Greek verb kano or ginome plus uh, an English adjective or a participle, ginome shocked, kano stuck. And they are very productive also in standard modern Greek, kano like. Uh, on Facebook, okay, kind of post, and so on and so forth. Uh, adverbs, prepositional phrases and clauses. Uh, speakers may insert adverbs from English to modify clauses or adjectives. To edo grammar officially, he gave him a letter officially. Probably the Denise. You probably didn't see her. Uh, insertions also include English prepositional phrases or clauses. So, is under pressure, when you're under pressure, to nero in a sun lake, in a like a lake, a key. Water is like a lake there. It must have been the day before or something like this. That I had spoken to him and he was angry with me. Όταν τον είδα, τελευταία φορά, he was very excited to see me. Last time I saw him, he was very excited to see me. Yeah? And uh, discourse markers or pragmatic particles uh, are among the most common borrowed or code switched items in language contact situations, also in Australian Greek. Uh, these are small uh, words or phrases that uh, occur very, very frequently uh, in oral speech, and they display rich functions. Uh, here you can see one conversational exchange, um, uh, which has been transcribed following conversation analytic conventions. So some of the conventions uh, that you see on the slide refer to uh, aspects of speech delivery, temporal relationships in conversation. Uh, uh, here it's uh, Minas, uh, a first generation Greek uh, male uh, who pages through a book that contains photos of his village in Greece. Uh, and in lines one uh, and two, Minas says, Αυτό το βιβλίο ξέρει πόσε φορέ το έχω ανοίξει, πολλέ φορέ. Do you know how many times I've opened this book? Many times. Uh, and in line four, the researcher asks him, όταν σε πιάνει νοσταλγία, when you feel nostalgic, and Minas confirms in line five, ναι. Yes. In line seven, the researcher asks Minas if he feels nostalgic about Greece, σε πιάνει συχνά. And Minas delivers his response in lines eight, uh, nine, and ten. You know, Πάντα ή τη μισή μέρα, you think, ε, θυμάσαι πίσω, την άλλη μισή κοιτάζεις τη δουλειά. You know, always, half of the day, you think, you remember, the rest of the day, you focus on the job. Uh, so here he uses the discourse marker, you know, to establish common ground and increase solidarity with the interlocutor. Uh, and in Australian Greek, we can see that the English discourse marker, you know, maintains the functions that it has in English conversation. So that's a very typical example. And another similar case is visible in extract two. Costadina and the researcher. Uh, Costadina is a, a first generation uh, female uh, Greek. Uh, in the course of a telling about her first years in Australia, she uses the discourse marker sequence and then in lines five and seven. 
uh, to connect uh, structurally coordinate units and signal temporal sequentiality. In line one, she says, I was 28 years when I arrived here. And then she starts uh, narrating the stories, uh, the, the events of the story. And then, San ήρθα με εδώ, and then, and έπιασα δουλειά. Τα παιδιά πήγαν σχολείο κατευθείαν, and then έπιασα δουλειά στο ράψιμο. Okay, and then when we came here, and then and I found a job, kids went to school straight away, and then I started working as a seamstress. Sometimes um, English discourse markers are used along with the equivalent Greek discourse marker within the same utterance. In this extract, uh, in lines one and two and three, Petrula says, uh, she's in the middle of a storytelling uh, about her trip to New York. Uh, and she says, έπρεπε νέα λέγω επειδή είχα ακολουθούσα την κόρη και το γαμπρό και έτσι αν ήξερα το χοτέλι είχα λεφτά να το να πληρώσω τάξη. I should have done it, yes, but because I had, I was following my daughter and son-in-law uh, and uh, so, if I had known uh, the, the name of the hotel, I had money to pay for uh, a taxi. Uh, so, she's in the middle of a storytelling. Here, she makes a comment. This is a digression from uh, the story's line of main events. Uh, and in line five, Petrula uses well, a la a well, to close the digression and return to the story's line of main events. Uh, in the immediately next position, within the same utterance, the speaker uses the equivalent Greek discourse marker telos pandon. Ah, well, telos pandon. Okay, so here we see what is um, described in the literature as a bilingual self-repeat. Okay, that's a bilingual self-repeat, which is extremely common in the data that I collected. Well, telos pandon. Epigame to New York, kiama vienam exo, pigiename kapu yanafame. Okay, we went to New York and we went someplace to eat. Now, Greek immigrants often describe the code mixed utterances examined uh, so far, discussed so far, as Greek Australian or Australian Greek or Elino Australesica. Emis Milame Elino Australesica. This type of code mixing is understood as a discourse mode uh, that belongs to the repertoire, the communicative repertoire of the speech community. Code mixing indexes, highlights, shows the Australian Greek identity. And I'm sure that many of you are familiar with this type of code mixing. Note, however, that the lexical borrowings and code mixing we have discussed so far are not grammatical errors. These are not syntactic errors, okay? Australian Greek, Elino Australesica, is not broken Greek, and it's not a bad version of Greek. This is the Greek variety spoken by a diasporic community. The forms and the, pat the such forms and such patterns routinely occur, commonly occur in language contact situations. They are highly expected in this social environment. Okay, this is something that we should bear in mind when we discuss those issues because there could be negative reactions, you know, or um, uh, evaluative stances towards the use of these forms. Uh, it's not a problem, not at all. It's perfectly fine. The fact that we mix English and Greek is uh, um, something to be expected in this context. Um, okay, we can move on to conversational code switching. Conversational code switching, also known as discourse-related code switching, marks or highlights aspects of conversational structure. In my data, first-generation Greeks switch languages from Greek to English to do several things in interaction. Uh, to pursue the recipient's response, we will see an example. Accomplice actions that invoke symmetry, lack of symmetry between speaker and hearer. Uh, we will see uh, one relevant example. Close or open sequences, we will also see an example. Uh, report direct speech, make strong positive assessments, deliver new information, among many, many other things. Uh, let's have a look at some indicative um, examples as promised and let's start with extract four uh, pursuing a response so greek immigrants use code switching language alternation to pursue response when a speaker does an action that solicits a response by the recipient but the recipient does not give one 
either because she did not understand or hear the speaker's prior utterance or because she ignored it. Okay, <laughs> all options are, are there. The speaker may pursue a response by clarifying what was said, uh, by modifying their position, reviewing, assume common knowledge. In Australian Greek conversation, speaker, speakers may pursue a response by producing the whole utterance in English and change momentarily the established language of interaction, which is Greek. Here, extract four comes from an audio recorded conversation between Petrula and the researcher at Petrula's house. Petrula and the researcher are having coffee. Petrula brings two types of cake on the table and the researcher keeps drinking her coffee without trying any of the cakes. I don't know why, but this is what I did <laughs> back then. It's not typical of how I behave. I like cakes usually. Uh, okay, so in line one, Petrula offers the researcher one of the cakes. Pareki apo to cake, to cake in Greek. The researcher does not respond. In line two, you see these numbers um, in the parentheses. Uh, they refer to silence counted in tenths of a second. Uh, Petrula redes uh, the offer in line three, pursuing the recipient's response. You want one of the of the other cake. After and she switches to uh, English. Okay. After uh, another silence, in line uh, uh, four. Uh, the researcher in line five rejects the offer. I think these are enough. So how does Petrula pursue her recipient's response? First, the speaker reformulates the action by offering the second type of cake and using a question format that projects the relevance of an answer. It anticipates a response by the addressed recipient. Second, Petrula switches to English and establishes a contrast between the language used in previous turns and the language used in her current turn. The speaker uses this contrast created by uh, language alternation as an additional practice for marking the redoing of the action, getting the recipient's attention, and pursuing her response. Code switching also occurs when speakers do actions that presuppose uh, or invoke lack of symmetry between the speaker and the hearer. I will show you one case in which the lack of symmetry depends on the social roles that participants perform in a given moment in interaction. In line one, Petrula offers the researcher cookies and the researcher says that she has brought some, gets up and goes to get her the biscuits from her bag. Okay, I also have cookies if you want some. And the researcher says, I've also brought some biscuits. And then she gets up, as you can see in the next lines, to uh, uh, go get the biscuits from her bag. And in line six and seven, Petrula commands the researcher not to get the biscuits. Mivgalista, no, 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 no. Leave it there, leave it there, leave it there. Okay, she begins her utterance using the imperative mood with a sharp intonation rise, especially increased loudness. Mivgalista, okay. After a cutoff, the speaker continues her turn in English. She repeats uh, the item no, the imperative leave it there with increased loudness. And the researcher complies with the command and returns to the table. Commands are directive actions. Their utterance is designed to get someone to do something for us. And of course, through command, speakers can assert control or authority over the recipient. Uh, speakers' control or authority over the recipient may be related to speakers' entitlement to do certain things, given the status that they have, what people are allowed to do given the status that they have, okay? That's entitlement. In this case, Petrula is allowed to command the researcher not to get the biscuits because of her role as the hostess, who is expected to treat her visitor and gets offended by the visitor's move to eat her own food, something not to be expected in a Greek house. Petrula uses code switching to implement the command that activates lack of symmetry between the recipient and herself. And this lack of symmetry is based on speakers' entitlements, which derive from cultural norms. Another example uh, here in extract six, opening sequences, courses of action um, carried out through uh, talk. Minas, a first generation uh, Male employs, uh, Greek male employs code switching to mark the initiation of a sequence that is incidental to the ongoing sequence structure. Uh, incidental sequences are produced in the face of overt trouble. 
uh, when there is failure to secure a cognition of a referent or to produce an item when the time for articulation has come. Here, the sequence is produced because the speaker fails to retrieve a word in Greek. As you can see in lines one and two, Minas refers to his nephew who was a student in Thessaloniki. In line two, the, the speaker has trouble finding the Greek word to refer to his nephew's occupation, as shown by the sound prolongation. Itane, he was. Okay, and in line two, Minas initiates a word search sequence. What they call them. Itane, what they call them. Uh, and in doing that, he switches to English. Language alternation indicates that what the speaker is currently doing is not a continuation of the telling about his nephew. It concerns the speaker's lexical retrieval problem. The code switch in line two marks a shift in the trajectory of action. After uh, a silence in line three, Minas continues this sequence uh, at line four, asking the researcher to provide the correct word uh, what's enough to που είναι με τα nuclear ship. Uh, he delivers the utterance in Greek. He inserts a verb phrase, what, and the noun phrase, nuclear ship, from English. And the insertion of the verb phrase, what, is an instance of code mixing. Uh, we discussed this before. The insertion of the noun phrase, nuclear ship, is related to Minas' competence in Greek. We will also see an example shortly, a similar one. Uh, the researcher provides the Greek word. Uh, in line seven, nuclear meta meta pirenική energia, and Minas closes down the sequence by accepting the answer. Yeah, pirenika get that he was yeah he was working on nuclear energy and such things. So he, he inserts the English particle yeah to express agreement. Okay, these are instances of code mixing. We discussed similar um, uh, cases before. Uh, now let's have a look at. Uh, Positive assessments. Switching from Greek to English can also occur in strong positive assessments. This extract comes from a conversation between Kula, Takis, and their granddaughter, Jennifer. Uh, in line one, Jennifer comments on the duration of flights from Australia to Greece. Mia hora, tres horas, a taxi, more than that, I don't know. She doesn't like uh, flying. Um, uh, you know, the, if the, when the flight duration is so long. Uh, in line one, yes, she makes this comment. And then in line four, Kula positively evaluates the experience of flying with a plane in English. Uh, eh, it's beautiful, Jennifer. Okay, she delivers this positive evaluation, this assessment in English with emphasis. And in the next line, she continues in Greek, as you can see in line seven. She corners, she passes, so you stand up, you move around, blah, blah, blah. Hmm? So, uh, summarizing switches from Greek to English can be uh, interactionally motivated and they are associated with locally defined uh, meanings. And there are uh, certain cases uh, in which the code switching is participant related or, or preference related. I will show you one example, and that will be the last example. Uh, certain switches from Greek into English are triggered by word searches, are related to speakers' competence in Greek and their preferences for the use of Greek or English. For example, Greek immigrants may insert items from English and then point to the fact that this language should not have been used because it does not accommodate their own preferences. Um, and here is one um, uh, relevant example. Uh, this segment comes from a storytelling about Kostadina's son, so it's Kostadina, a third generation female Greek who narrates a story about uh, her son. Uh, and in lines one and two and four, Kostadina has trouble retrieving a word. Exeris in exeris pos na supo friendly. Okay, uh, she inserts the English adjective friendly. Uh, you know, he is, you know, how should I explain this to you, friendly? And initiates a word search sequence whereby she requests the correct Greek word and gives an account for her incompetence. Postolene sta, I don't know, stelenica, how do we say, I don't know, in Greek. The researcher provides the word filikos, friendly, uh, in Greek. Kostadin accepts the answer, filikos, yes. Okay, repeating the Greek word, using the positive response token, yes. And in the, uh, in the next uh, uh, position, the speaker delivers a self-assessment. We forgot Greek. That marks her incompetence in retrieving the Greek word as worthy of on-topic talk. Interestingly, she employs first-person plural, 
uh, ξεχάσαμε, to refer to herself as part of a collectivity that includes Greeks living in Australia. And this collective self-reference introduces the speaker's Australian Greek identity as a feature of a context that is interactionally relevant. And then she starts laughing, invites the researcher into laughing. There is shared laughter. So this is treated as something funny uh, in a good way. Okay, uh, And the speaker seems to treat the insertion of the English item as inappropriate verbal activity, which makes her Australian Greek identity interactionally relevant. It brings the, the, the aspect, this aspect of her identity to the surface of uh, the talk and interaction. What can we say about the factors influencing language maintenance in Cairns? Uh, in the last part of my talk, I would like to discuss the social factors, uh, which are related to uh, speakers' identities, and domains of use, such as generation, marital status, family, friendship, employment, and education. Let's start with generation, which proves to be a key factor in maintaining Greek in Cairns. First generation Greeks use Greek to communicate with spouses, children, and friends from their ethnic group. Second generation Greeks use Greek uh, more often to communicate with first generation Greeks, such as parents, older relatives, or friends. Endogamy also is a crucial factor. Uh, marrying, uh, marriage with someone from the same ethno-linguistic group reduces language shift. It's a factor that promotes main, the maintenance of Greek among first-generation Greeks. Marriages with partners who belong to the same ethno-linguistic group were very common. First-generation Greeks treated marriages between Greeks and non-Greeks as a threat to the maintenance of their ethnic identity. Interestingly, there is uh, a word um, uh, that refers to the process of becoming less Greek and similar to foreigners in the Greek community in Cairns, Xenevo. Once an informant uh, made the following derogatory comment about other Greeks who lived in Cairns, got married to non-Greeks and cut their bonds from the Greek community. Padrevtikan me xenus ki echun xenepsia. Okay, they got married to foreigners and they have become like them. Uh, family, both nuclear and extended, promotes language maintenance. First-generation Greek parents used Greek to communicate with their spouse, their children, with same age relatives or older relatives. So Greek was the preferred means of communication within the home environment. Second-generation Greeks used Greek or English to communicate with their parents. English, they used English to communicate with their spouses, siblings, or other second-generation relatives and friends. Grandchildren and these are the third generation Greeks, used their limited Greek vocabulary when they communicated with their grandparents. Um, we may also say that the maintenance of Greek has been facilitated by frequent trips of first generation or second generation Greeks from Australia to Greece. Uh, some third generation Greeks reported that they tried to visit their homeland uh, once per year. They enjoyed speaking with their relatives in Greece via Skype or on the phone. Okay, so these things play an important role. But about friendship, the friendship domain is also related to the maintenance of Greece, of Greek. First generation Greeks mostly socialized at the Christian Orthodox Church. They participated in ethnically homogeneous friendship networks. Uh, a female informed, uh, informant uh, reported that uh, her husband was not fluent in English because he socialized only with Greeks. Ο σύζυγός μου, παρόλο που είχε έρθει πιο νωρίς, δεν μιλούσε γιατί έκανε με Έλληνες μόνο παρέα. On the other hand, the employment domain promoted the use of the dominant language, English. The language of the majority that carries prestige, it carries uh, it is the symbolic capital, uh, a sort of uh, symbolic capital in the linguistic market of Cairns. The use of English increased opportunities at work, economic success, social upward mobility. It was a tool for integration, for professional success in the mainstream Australian society. In most Greek families, both women and men worked and they were significantly exposed to the use of English in interaction with non-Greek speakers. Uh, a female informant said uh, at some point uh, that Serviriza dulava sto magazi ke well, ikha kathe mera, you know, me tos pelates, κουβεντιάζαμε και εκεί έμαθα αγγλικά, έμαθα καλά, αλλά δεν ξέρω να γράφω και να διαβάζω. Okay. Uh, yet, in some cases, the alienation involved in working in advanced capitalist Australia did not allow lots of interaction with non-Greeks. As a male informant reported, 
Uh, πολλοί Έλληνε δεν μάθανε Εγγλέζικα γιατί εξαρτάται πού δουλεύει. Άμα είσαι κάπου που δουλεύει πίσω, δεν βλέπει κανέναν όλη μέρα, δεν μιλά με κανέναν, ναι, ξέχασέ το. <coughs> the cultural activities organized at the St. John Paris of Kent uh, facilitated the maintenance of Greek in the region. Uh, a number of social activities took place within the Paris such as a seniors group weekly gathering uh, called Kali Parea uh, and Greek dance classes. Once per year, the Paris would organize a Greek festival that promoted Greek culture, food and dances. This festival was one of the major cultural events in Kent, and it certainly encouraged the use of the Greek language among Greeks who joined uh, the activities. There was also a Greek school um, language class operating within the Paris once per week, which is also very It was very beneficial, this type of ethnic school. Media also played an important role. Uh, newspapers and radio reporting news and events about Greece and the Greek community in Australia. Uh, I remember Greek immigrants in Cairns telling me uh, that they attend, that they attended the daily SBS radio program that broadcasted news about Australian, Greek and international current affair. There was also a local radio show broadcasting in Cairns Community Radio Network once per week. Uh, the community radio went on to air in 1985. Uh, it broadcasted different types of programs with volunteer staff from diverse ethnic backgrounds. Uh, the Greek radio show played Greek music, announcements about the local activities of the Greek community and allowed Greeks who lived in Cairns to stay connected. Some Greeks had online access to Greek TV series and they were frequently exposed to the use of standard modern Greek and also digital media and social media made contact with Greek a daily experience. Now for uh, second and third generation Greeks, Greek is a symbolic language, a symbolic heritage uh, language. Uh, which has the power to connect speakers across generations. For third generation Greeks, there might be little knowledge of Greek, but uh, there is still some sort of cultural transmission through language. The use of simple terms, simple family terms like yaya or papouz, or food items like pita, shuvlaki or tzatziki is part of a process of intergenerational transfer of the symbolic functions of Greek. Uh, that creates, this transfer creates a sense of belonging. Um, in a paper on heritage languages in Canada, Christina Kramer notes that every word learned or retained is an intercultural stepping stone. The same holds for Greek in Australia. Every Greek word learned or retained is an intercultural stepping stone. I would like to finish with this thought. Thank you again for your invitation. And a warm thank, a thank you, Efharisto, to the Greek immigrants in Cairns, Far North Queensland, for their cooperation uh, and intellectual uh, partnership. I am happy to answer any questions. I can already see. Um, thank, thank, um, thank, thank you, um, Angeliki. Uh, what can I say? What a fascinating um, presentation. I'm sure there'll be quite a few questions from the audience. I just uh, might kickstart off the questioning. Um, what you presented, when I compare it with, say, Melbourneian Greek, uh, I must say in Melbourne, I haven't come across the word blanketa. Hmm. I haven't come across the word resiti. Uh -huh. uh, no taxasi. We do say taxasia. In nakanta taxasia, it's like tax time. Nakanta for a We do say uh -huh. that. Nor have I heard flasico. Uh, that's sort of what's different to Melbourneian uh, Greek. Yeah. Also noticed um, you didn't give any examples of expletives unless you were self exercising self-censorship like Matipana year or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, and um, what I also wanted to ask is that um, the majority of migrants that came to Australia, I would say, came from rural areas of Greece and, and barely would have had a... Um, a primary school education. Um, in the in the cut, did, did you have an example? Um, the first generation cohort that you interviewed, were you aware of the educational background? Was there a difference between those who didn't finish primary school and maybe those who had a few levels of high school in their sort of the extent of code switching? So, did you see any differences there in the first generation cohort? 
Yeah, Nick, yeah, thank you for... There, but... <laughs> yeah, 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 no, and they are great comments and questions. Uh, look, regarding the difference between uh, the Greek spoken in Cairns and the Greek spoken in Melbourne, of course, there are, uh, there, there should be differences and differences are to be expected. The community in Cairns was an isolated community. Um, it's a remote tropical city, Cairns, as I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, and we should also uh, uh, highlight that there is a lot of individual variation um, regarding the different forms used. So there were some speakers who would pre who preferred the use of blanqueta or caro. So you would encounter the use of caro very frequently in their speech. And there were other speakers, first generation Greeks, who would never use this term. So there is individual variation. Uh, now, regarding the education uh, background, that was uh, primary school. There were graduates, primary school graduates, or maybe not even that. Uh, they were literate in Greek, uh, but they came from uh, um, uh, rural areas in Greece, especially, as you know very well, in the 60s or in late 40s early 50s, some people migrated in mid-60s, uh, things in Greece were very rough. And especially for women, that meant that they did not have access to a high school, a secondary education. Uh, so the majority of the women um, uh, had graduated from primary school uh, and the majority, maybe some of them, not, not all of them. Uh, it, code switching does not uh, depend on uh, your education uh, background, uh, really, okay? It, it depends on uh, how immersed you are in the English-speaking community, uh, social factors, whether English has become a pragmatically dominant language in your communicative repertoire or not. Uh, and also maybe uh, you saw that uh, for, for Minas, this first generation male Greek, um, when he, he would switch to uh, English, his utterances, his sentences were not ideal sentences, grammatically ideal in English, because he's a late bilingual. Uh, his com the communicative competence differs among uh, different first generation Greeks. Um, and th their competence uh, in grammar or vocabulary also differs, but this doesn't really matter, okay? We consider these people to be bilinguals because they, uh, regard themselves uh, in such a way and they use uh, at least two different languages uh, to conduct daily uh, interaction, daily conversation. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I answered. I would be, it would be fascinating for me to visit Melbourne and collect data from uh, Melbourne, <laughs> to be honest, from the first generation or the second generation as well, or even the third generation, okay? Because Greek as a symbolic heritage language in Australia is also a very fascinating topic and not well yes. researched. And I conclude they didn't use expletives in their conversations. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Malakas. Malakas also is evocative. Uh, you know that it's very frequent uh, in standard modern Greek um, interaction. And it was also common uh, in Australian Greek. And it was also uh, a marker, uh, sort of, that uh, non-Greeks would use in order to identify someone uh, with... Uh, the Greek culture. Uh, okay. So it's interesting okay. also how Malakas is used <laughs> among Greeks. Yeah, that's a whole, whole, whole seminar itself, I think. And, uh, yeah, 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 it's true. Um, just a question here from Conspiropoulos. I thought he was still online. Uh, yeah. Uh, Costa, you want to ask um, your first question? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk there, uh, and get a gear. You're giving me some ideas uh, to teach modern Greek. I think um, for, to a class of non Greeks, Next school to whether I should just do stand don't bother standing modern Greek or just do Greek Australian Greek and learn it that way maybe. Um, my yeah. question is um, um, first one is um, how did the Greek community of Cairns respond to your fieldwork of Cairns, especially the first and second generation? How were they? How did they perceive it? And my next one is um, what similarities and differences exist between Greek Australian and and the use of foreign words in standing modern Greek? Like I've noticed that in listening to commentators too whether. In the context of sarcasm, they're thrown in botanical vedas, as I say, like to try to impress someone. And like, like in a way, is that modern Greek going through its own the kind of like, like globalization more or less, influenced mm. by 
American English or British English, soft power, you know, all that. I'm yeah, about yeah. That because one, two different ways. Like, is it a parallel pathway or there's differences or similarities or, you know, it's all evolving, shall we say, differently. It's standard modern Greek and even it's going through its um, identity crisis of some sort or, you know, call it what you want. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 Con. Good questions. Well, uh, the Greek community of Cairns uh, responded to my fieldwork in a very positive way, I must say. Uh, so they really welcomed uh, me in the community. Uh, they allowed me to join the activities, attend the activities, the cultural uh, activities, uh, or the public activities organized there at the parish. Um, so I have very, very good memories. Uh, and I, I thank them for their collaboration and their intellectual partnership and their support. Uh, sometimes they would project their personal um, experience uh, on me. So they would see, they could see themselves uh, through the lens of my work. Uh, I was a young 33 year old uh, woman who went there to work and uh, that was similar to their own experience when they arrived in their late 20s or early 30s in Australia to work, okay? Uh, and th th there was this uh, association. Uh, and, and that was helpful also for my field work because that made communication with them much easier. And the same applies to the second generation. The second generation um, also had an issue with their identity. Uh, am I too Australian? to Greek, not Greek enough, or not Australian enough, okay? It was a, um, something that they had to negotiate. Uh, and they were also interested in knowing uh, what the situation was back then in 2013. Uh, there was this financial crisis going on in Greece, and I was like a representative of the homeland, uh, which is also treated as a sort of a utopia land. Uh, I don't know if that's the case in Melbourne, but I, I, I found that there is this romanticized version of Greece um, among some of the immigrants I met in Cairns, which was interesting. Uh, and emotionally loaded, very loaded. Uh, now, similarities and differences between Greek Australian compared to Greeks who use foreign words when speaking in standard modern Greek. There are some similar processes taking place. So in standard modern Greek, we also use uh, the discourse marker anyway the English discourse marker anyway. Anyway, big IQ, okay? Uh, and that's part of uh, language change. Language change is uh, something normal. It uh, occurs across different languages, different uh, social contexts. But when two languages are in contact, as uh, is the case in an immigrant community, these things are much more intense. Okay, or they are subjected to different factors as well, educational factors, occupational factors, in-group factors. Uh, so there are some similar processes. Can or like, so Facebook, that's a bilingual compound verb also found in standard modern Greek as we speak. And that was one of the most frequent features in Australian Greek uh, spoken in Cairns. Cano vacuum cleaner, cano high school, cano plus anything goes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so there are some similarities, yeah. But Angelique, would you say that, um, let's say, native Greek speakers, when they use um, English words, they don't sort of Hellenize them, you know what I mean? They keep them um, as they are in English rather than, um, you know, um, giving a gender to them or something like that. I think that's an, a tendency I've observed. Or, uh, uh, so w when they would insert English nouns or uh, adjectives, English terms, uh, they would um, follow. Yeah, they adapt the English uh, word in the as, of as is rather than sort of Hellenizing it. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah I've, I would say so. Yeah. Got a question from um, Georgia, uh, but it's this: uh, mm -hmm. the retention of our Greek language is very important to first-generation Greeks living in Australia. How long do you think before the language disappears? I'm tempted to answer. It all depends on us. Uh, and follow up with that question. Will we end up like Greek-speaking people in southern Italy or the Pontians in relation to the ancient Greek language? So, Well, uh, Georgia, thank you for your question. I don't think that uh, Greek will uh, disappear soon, very soon, <laughs> from the Australian region. Uh, there is language shift taking place. So it's true that some 
of the second generation Greeks I met in Cairns or the third generation Greeks I met in Cairns have abandoned the use of Greek uh, in favor of English. Okay, that's true. And probably that's the case uh, for some uh, Melbournians there, uh, some, some Greeks living in Melbourne, especially the, the third or the fourth generation. Uh, but I must say that Greek immigrants have a very successful history of language maintenance, especially in Australia, because there is an interrelation of language and religion and a sense of belonging, okay? And, uh, and um, uh, Greek maintains, maybe it's not used uh, for public functions, but it is certainly used for private functions. It is a language that creates a sense of belonging and it carries, um, it is cultural capital among uh, immigrants who live in Australia. It's important for their uh, ethnic identity. Uh, it's an index, a marker of in-group in membership. But these things change, of course, okay? Maybe uh, things will not be the same in the next 10 or 20 years. Uh, but I'm, um, I, I see things from a positive perspective. I also think digital media or social media can play an important role uh, in maintaining Greek. Um, because you are exposed to standard modern Greek on a daily basis, and that's important. Uh, and that was not the case 40 years ago, okay? I remember Greek immigrants telling me stories about how they would, uh, that they were waiting for a letter to come, uh, you know, from uh, the mother who was living on that island, that remote island, and uh, you know, sad stories. Uh, there was uh, the communication was not um, easy back then. That's not the case now. Yes. And fo follow up question by Georgia: uh, Is there any similar research happening in Greece? about the introduction of English words, especially around technology, uh, into the Greek language. Yes, definitely, Georgia, yeah. Yeah, especially within the field of linguistics. Uh, language contact induced change and borrowing is a topic that uh, we investigate thoroughly, uh, the Greek linguists. Uh, if you want any references, I, I would be happy to send you some. You can uh, email me if you want. Uh, I think we've got, this is, seems to be more like a comment rather than a question. So from Spiza Dimitrio, so creating context for reception of Greek is important for its continuation in Australia. Yes, I would say so, yeah. Uh, there are some social factors that definitely facilitate the maintenance of a minority language, a community language um, in uh, in, in such contexts, okay, where immigration has taken place and you, but right now, third generation Greeks or fourth generation Greeks um, uh, need to work on uh, on their Greek a bit. <laughs> so uh, educational factors, the provision for uh, Greek as a medium of instruction plays an important role. Community uh, institutions, uh, language schools, other organizations can play an important role provisions for radio or TV broadcasts uh, in Greek also can facilitate the maintenance of Greek. Uh, but what will happen in the end depends on uh, the social profile of the community, uh, the desires that you have there, you know, the, the way you define yourselves, the way you perceive yourselves. It's not something that can be uh, fully controlled, okay? It's not the, the linguist who will decide on what is going to happen. These are the, it's the speakers who decide um, on the destiny of the home language. But I, I think that it will survive. Greek will survive in Australia based on what I've seen when I was there, uh, even in Kent, which is such a remote place. I mean, and see, uh, things are looking good, uh, relatively good. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. And then Greek also is a, is a language that has this very long history. Uh, and it, it carries its own prestige as a language because of the long history it has. And speakers have more motivations to, to reserve it, maintain it as part of their communicative repertoire. Um, and in, um, in Cairns itself, you didn't come across any examples of Neofermeni who might have come there during a crisis and who might have like reinvigorated the community. So Not really. I was maybe the first one to to go there as a new immigrant. Uh, 
I mean, one of the reasons why I migrated uh, to Australia was also the financial crisis and the fact that it was a fascinating job, of course. It was a good step for my uh, career and my development, my professional development. Uh, I was part of a very fascinating uh, language and culture research center at James Cook University. Um, very stimulating environment. So I was lucky to be there, but I was one of the new immigrants. I remember when I was flying to Australia, for example, uh, there was a lady uh, traveling together with me, wishing me good luck, uh, you know, uh, because she was also migrating together with her daughter. So you had the same um, experience, the same history that took place in the 60s, uh, or earlier, even earlier, or a bit later, you could see this history being repeated now uh, in uh, a different context, in the context of the third millennium. Other people, other new immigrants were not present around. But I'm sure that in Melbourne, you've got plenty. Uh, we've opened two new school yeah. campuses to, to cater for those students and those new arrivals. Yeah, yeah, you've got plenty. Yeah. Um, and also the situation is different with these people because these people know English very well. And one of the reasons why they came there is because of their competence in English. That was not the case with the Greek immigrants, especially the first generation traveling to Australia, migrating to Australia in the 60s or in the 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't know any English at all. They learned English uh, in, in Australia. They were not uh, very educated. So uh, they were heroes, in <laughs> quotation marks, in, in a sense. <laughs> heroes, and, heroes and heroines. And, uh, yeah. and heroines, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, just another question. Um, from Cairns all the way down to Bundaberg and probably further north of Cairns, that's all sugarcane country. Uh, were yeah. they using any terminology related to that industry? Because as let's say first generation Greek migrants, even if they had a rural background, they would have been unfamiliar with sugar cane because most sugar in Greece comes from Tefla, from sugar beet. And uh, yeah, uh, did you encounter any any of those terms? Not, not no? really, not really. Uh, no, I, I didn't. So I, I did not observe uh, the, the use of such vocabulary, such register. Uh, but maybe it was um, the, the, the data I collected was limited in that respect. So uh, this doesn't mean that they don't use such terms. Okay. Um, um, it, it'd be good to have a look at the probably the latest census or even the last census to see um, because you can get the data um, by geographical region. Um, okay, you had a sample size of fifty, but what would the actual population probably be? Probably several hundred in your estimation. Yeah. We might yeah, yeah, yeah. Information from the latest census and uh, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I I met people uh, uh, in in the Paris at the Paris. Uh, this is where I met most of my informants. Uh, some Greeks who lived uh, in Cairns didn't want to be found. Okay, they didn't want to be uh, located, identified <laughs> <laughs> by the researcher. <laughs> so that's also normal. And uh, it's something that I we, we fully respect. OK, not everybody wants to join uh, the research of someone who went there for a couple of years to do something and then disappear. OK, that's perfectly normal. Uh, but the people I met uh, collaborated in a very smooth and generous manner. And I ate very good food. <laughs> Australian Greek food is delicious. <laughs> okay. um, I think we might bring proceedings uh, to a close. Angeliki, um, thanks once again for a really fascinating sort of presentation. And mm -hmm. um, I hope one day um, we'll see you um, in Melbourne presenting at the Yeah, Greek fingers Center. crossed. Fingers <laughs> crossed. And um, hope to have that coffee in Thessaloniki one day as well too. Okay. Yeah, absolutely, okay. Nick. Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, um, have a good remaining remaining day and um, uh, thanks once again everyone for following this presentation and look forward to seeing you in next week's hybrid um, seminar.